Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Hackers are using a severe Windows bug to compromise unpatched servers. Three JavaScript packages have been removed from the NPM portal for containing malicious code. Nokia has been tasked with building a new 4G cellular network on the moon. A new 80-watt wireless charging tech from Xiaomi is blowing our minds. And the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 has been released. We'll let you know the specs and how this changes things for industrial IoT. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Hackers are using a severe Windows bug to compromise unpatched servers. One of the most critical Windows vulnerabilities disclosed this year is under active attack by hackers who are trying to backdoor servers that store credentials for every user and administrative account on a network. Researchers gave the vulnerability the name Zero Logon because attacks work by sending a string of zeros in a series of messages that use the Net Logon protocol, which Windows servers rely on for a variety of tasks, including allowing end users to log in to a network. Zero Logon, as the vulnerability has been dubbed, gained widespread attention last month when the firm that discovered it said it could give attackers instant access to active directories, which admins use to create, delete, and manage network accounts. Active directories and the domain controllers they run on are among the most coveted prizes in hacking because, once hijacked, they allow attackers to execute code in Unition on all connected machines. Microsoft patched the security flaw in August. On Friday, Kevin Beaumont, working in his capacity as an independent researcher, said in a blog post that he had detected attacks on the honeypot he uses to keep abreast of attack hack attacks that hackers are using in the wild. When his Lure server was unpatched, the attackers were able to use a PowerShell script to successfully change an admin password and backdoor the server. Beaumont said that the attack appeared to be entirely scripted, with all commands being completed within seconds. With that, the attackers installed a backdoor, allowing remote administrative access to devices inside his mock network. The attackers also enabled remote desktop. As a result, they would continue to have remote access even if the admin later patches the server. People with no authentication can use the exploit to gain domain administrative credentials as long as the attackers have the ability to establish TCP connections with a vulnerable domain controller. In some cases, attackers may use a separate vulnerability to gain a foothold inside a network and then exploit zero logon to take over the domain controller. I think a good example of a way for these types of scripts to get into networks are out-of-date computers on the network Yep. And also um, social engineering scams. We hear a lot oh, about, gosh, yes. like, you probably received these emails that try to trick you into following through with a process of entering a credential or something like that. The, the risk that we run and, and the sad case that I see as in IT is that sometimes people think, well, I don't need to update that computer because it's in the back room and nobody really uses it. Yep. Or, oh, well, we need this one to still have Windows XP because we have problems with one of our printers if we don't. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of Windows 7 systems, and that is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. If you have a Windows 7 or Windows XP system on your network, just turn it off, get yeah. rid of it. Yep. See, the, the thing is, is with those systems, so Microsoft has what we call EOL or end of life. Uh, has, has ended the life of these operating systems. So they've said, you've got to upgrade to Windows 10. Well, I don't want to upgrade to Windows 10. I like my Windows 7. I understand that and I respect that. However, here's the problem. Hackers now are able to exploit these operating systems. Yep. And as they do that, as they find exploits, there's a couple of things that happen. One, they either give away or sell those exploits, or two, they're just, they're released to the public through, whether it's through the dark web or even on GitHub yep. as, as security research. 
And so now these hackers, if you will, we're going to call them that, but realistically, in a lot of cases, they're what we call script kitties. Mm -hmm. And these are um, not even like hackers, yes, but they don't have to have a lot of knowledge because the, the exploit is publicly That's right. known and understood. So if there are exploits that are available for an operating system, what do we expect to happen? We expect the operating system vendor, Microsoft in this case, to patch that exploit, to fix yeah. it. And that's the case with Windows 10. Sadly, though, those that are EOL. it's not the case with an EOL operating system. Sometimes we hear, oh, well, I don't need support. Well, Microsoft has ended support. That's what we've heard. Yeah. They've ended support for Windows 7. They've ended support for Windows XP. Oh, but I, I've never had to call support. I can handle it. That's not what they're talking about at all. Sorry. What they're saying is, is they will not fix the patches, it does, uh, the, the exploits. It doesn't matter how severe they are. It doesn't matter how easy they are to exploit. Yeah. So you have a Windows 7 machine on your network. Well, you are giving entry to one of these hackers who don't even have to be very good at hacking because the exploits are publicly known. Yep. Sometimes they're part of tools. Sometimes they can just yes. download a free tool and they can say, I want to, with one check, exploit Windows 7. And so they get into a Windows 7 box or they've tricked one of your employees, even if they're just somebody in the back working in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. They've tricked somebody into opening a file that now gives them access to the Windows 7 machine, the Windows XP machine, or the machine in the back room. Doesn't yeah. matter. And here we're learning that Microsoft servers now have an exploit that as long as a malicious party can gain access to any computer on the network, they can now get domain administrator access to the entire network. That's now, scary. Now, your Windows 10 machines are no longer safe. That's right. Because you've given them entry to your network as if they're a domain administrator. Oh, see, that's just bad news right there. <laughs> well, it's bad news. Why is ransomware a thing? Yeah. Because what do they do? They now, okay, I've gained access to this network. I'm going to sell on the dark web access to this network. Yep. You see this with, um, with townships and yes. uh, with cities that, was it the original script kitty who did it? No. What? He just, they just want, they want to get in, install their software and get out and then sell access. That's right. Because that's quick money. So why do people do it? For money. Yeah. And that's how they do it. So, um, yeah, you got to kind of keep things up to date. So, the, you know, just a quick thought to ponder. Hey, if you've got any obsolete machines on your network, you've got to get them off and get your staff trained on cybersecurity practices. Understand what phishing scams are because, you know, oh, well, somebody clicked on a link and now their computer's infected, but their computer is on your network. But I was going to get half of that prince's money. <laughs> That's a whole other <laughs> can of worms right there, Jeff. But I mean, I, when it comes to these kind of things, to look at your system and say, oh, I don't want to spend seven, eight hundred bucks for a new computer. I sure. won't worry about updating this one. You'll end up spending more in the long run uh, or in, in the short term. Um, no, in the long run, if you don't have your system patched, because once they get access to everything, you could be down and out. But uh, And I think... It, when they have access to everything. I think it's just important to realize that that one entry point becomes access to, to everything. everything. So spend a couple of hundred bucks, get the new computer. <laughs> Save yourself. I don't know what it takes. I mean, it's different, it's different for every case, right? Yeah. I had one person today who called and said, I have a single Windows 7 computer. I don't want to upgrade it because it just works. Oh. So here's, here's an explanation. And here, Becca has shared with us a story that simply tells us that all they need is access to that one computer. And now they've got access to all computers. of your computers. And not in just like a Samba way, not in a, a way that's like friendly and hopefully they don't find any ways into the back doors on those computers. No, they have administrator credentials on your network. So they can do anything. 
That's right. Anything they want. When I think about my house, I think I've got... You're done. I think I have seven devices, not including phones and tablets and stuff like that that are connected to the network. Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't want them to have access to that. Yeah, I just can't stress enough, though, Jeff. I mean, I think in the terms of businesses, more so oh, than the yeah. home user, but once they're in, they're in. you can't, that, you're done. Yeah. Because you can't now shut down that Windows machine, that Windows 7 machine. No, they're already into everything. So what do you do? Replace everything? Have every single computer wiped? Because you don't know what tools they've installed. That's expensive. Yeah, so don't fall into that. Anyways, that's a bad exploit. That's a really serious, folks. I hope yeah. we've stressed that enough that you understand that this is a bad one. So yeah. make sure your network administrators are up and up and they understand these things and that you are protected and safe against these kinds of threats. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to head back to Becca. Three JavaScript packages have been removed from the NPM portal for containing malicious code. According to advisories from the NPM security team, the three JavaScript libraries open shells on the computers of developers who imported the packages into their projects. The shells allow threat actors to connect remotely to the infected computer and execute malicious operations. The NPM security team said that the shells don't depend on a particular operating system and could be used to compromise Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and other systems. All three packages were uploaded to the NPM portal in 2018 and each had hundreds of downloads since then. The package's names are Plutov-Slack-Client, Node-Test-199, and Node-Test-1010. The NPM security team said, any computer that, is, that has this package installed or running should be considered fully compromised. All secrets and keys stored on that computer should be rotated immediately from a different computer. They warn the package should be removed, but as full control of the computer may have been given to an outside entity, there is no guarantee that removing the package will remove all malicious software resulting from installing it. MPM security staff regularly scans its collection of JavaScript libraries, considered the largest package repository for any programming language. While I can't even get good cell cover coverage at my cottage, Nokia is working with NASA to bring 4G to the moon. NASA's Artemis mission aims to establish a long-term human presence on the moon as a stepping stone toward Mars colonization. And to get things started, NASA is extending $370 million to 14 companies to provide the technology for the program from robotics to power generation and even cryogenics. But it makes sense that these teams will need to be able to communicate with the mother planet. The new network will be designed specifically for lunar conditions, able to withstand the extreme temperature shifts and radiation. The tech will also utilize small cell tech, which, as the name suggests, is significantly smaller than the tall cell towers they are used to seeing here on Earth. They also use a lot less power. The plan is for a lunar lander to carry the 4G communication system to the lunar surface in 2022. Nokia's Bell Labs has been granted $14.1 million for their part. A new 80-watt wireless charging tech from Xiaomi is blowing our minds, and the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 has been released. We'll let you know the specs and how this changes things for industrial IoT. Becca has these stories coming up. Plus, Robert is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Last week we spoke about banks. In a few years' time you will not recognize them anymore. And uh, I also mentioned to you not so long ago the Chinese digital currency that will replace the renminbi and that they already implemented it and they are running some trials in Shenzhen. Now this week there has been some development and I would like to talk about that because it will have a direct impact on your life and my life. So let's dive into this here. <clears throat> 
the International Monetary Fund. And the head of that international organization is a lady called Kristalina Georgieva, and she delivered a speech in regards to the new Bretton Woods moment. Now, what is a Bretton Woods? Bretton Woods system is uh, monetary management established uh, the rules of commercial and financial relations between uh, countries like US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and Japan. And so it's, uh, the system was first example of a fully negotiated order intended to govern monetary relations between independent states. So that was Bretton Woods. And she's speaking about the change of that system into something more modern. Now, interesting enough, on Monday, there was a meeting with a few central bankers talking about so-called cross-border payments. But if you think about it, look what type of people there were uh, present. So you've got the head of the Saudi central bank. You have got the head of all the central banks the head of the IMF, the head of the US Central Bank, and the head of the Malaysian Central Bank. Missing is Europe, which is interesting, but there will be a reason, I guess. So they met together to talk about gross border payments. Now, I don't believe that that's a real story. The real story uh, was also published by a gentleman called Raul Paul, uh, which I totally concur with. So his thoughts is exactly how I'm thinking. And what he's talking about is exactly this meeting that happened on Monday and that will replace the old Bretton Woods uh, relationship between uh, countries. So what will happen? It looks like that the central banks will collude and come up with a system, uh, a central bank system between all of them. So there will not be not a US dollar central bank system. There will be one for each, uh, for all organizations. And then from there, it will be um, and diversified. And what can you do with such a system? That's the interesting part. And I love that. Is <clears throat> So it will change the, the circumvent the banking and finance, uh, fiscal system because you're directly interacting with people. Yeah. So it's not like at the moment where the central bank in the US or Canada doesn't matter, <clears throat> comes up with some policy and then it goes, it trickles down um, uh, the chain and you as the individual user, you probably see the least amount of money and probably at the highest interest rate that you can think of. Other people will benefit much stronger. With digital money uh, plus uh, cryptocurrency, so programmable money, you're able to do much more because now the central bank can directly influence uh, the behavior of people. And how do they do that? Yes, they can say, well, if you're a restaurant owner, you can, uh, you get the money directly into your pocket from us. Yeah. So no more banks involved. We'll do it directly. It's possible. It's central bank money. They can change interest rates. So in one uh, instance or one industry, they can have a higher interest rate than in other. Um, what will happen with taxes? Yeah. What will happen with the IRS? Because they can deal with these things directly through programmable money. It will take time to get it to that ultimate extent, but it will happen, um, as, you, as you can see. So direct payments will be possible. Um, they're also talking here about um, yeah, behavioral uh, economics. Uh, so not through some economists that are telling the government what to do and what not to do, because that has failed in the past, uh, everybody's saying. So what they're going to do is like a Facebook type of idea or TikTok idea or YouTube idea where you're interested in people befriending you or where people are, you're interested in getting more likes. And so you change your behavior in regards to getting more likes. And the same thing will happen with the money. So, and that will be all regulated through a central bank uh, without anybody from the outside world having a chance to have a significant influence. So how that will look like at the end, nobody knows, of course, but that these people are meeting together to discuss uh, cross-order payments is something that I find uh, highly interesting. And uh, that is, of course, fantastic news for uh, Bitcoin because Bitcoin is outside of that system. There's nobody that can regulate uh, Bitcoin. It's decentralized, um, it's immutable, but you know all the features of, of uh, Bitcoin. So um, Bitcoin is a fantastic alternative. All the other cryptocurrencies, the major ones, are definitely a good alternative. Let's see what Libra will bring up. 
but there will be some good alternatives to um, to the central uh, centrally uh, driven money through central banks. So I hope you found that interesting and I hope you liked it and I hope I get a like from you and I wish you a fantastic week. So thank you very much for watching. Bye bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder, we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever changing and always volatile. So you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. Xiaomi has announced a new charging tech that can fully charge a depleted smartphone in less than 20 minutes, but it does it without any wires. Fast charging has become a key feature of many smartphones in recent years, and for convenience sake, wireless charging can be really great. But of course, wireless charging typically charges a phone with between 10 to 15 watts of power. Some phones, like the OnePlus 8 Pro, have wireless charging up to 40 watts, but Xiaomi's new charging tech promises a whopping 80 watts of wireless juice. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, according to the announcement unveiling the 80-watt Mi wireless charging technology, a smartphone with 0% charge of a 4,000 milliamp hours battery will charge 10% in just one minute, 50% in eight minutes, and be fully charged after 19 minutes. Finally, a charger that will charge my phone from zero to 100% right? in like my lunch break. See, that's nice. That's a game changer. Can you imagine? I think about my kids and how we have like phones everywhere. <laughs> Obviously, I, I mean, this is going to take like the latest and greatest tech, but um, it's always a case of, oh, I forgot to put my phone on the charger or it doesn't last long enough for the entire day. And now that, you know, with the pandemic, of course, my kids are being homeschooled now kind of by force and everybody's on their devices the whole yeah. time. So we've got Zoom meetings happening on phones and and it runs it depletes the battery yes but what i like is that it's wireless it's not just wired that's fast amazing charging. yeah it's wireless that's huge like yeah the idea that i could take my phone not have to worry about chargers and just go just set it down set it down 20 mm -hmm. minutes later i'm good to go that i love the other thing that i love about it the the concept is that um i think about as you just did if I could set it down on a table, what if you could set it down on a restaurant table? Yes. Because a lot of restaurants have gone the route, and I'm using restaurants as the example, but a lot of places have gone the route of embedding USB. Yes. So that you can plug in your USB cable to charge your phone. But then all of a sudden people got wise to the fact that, oh, those USB ports could be malicious because yeah. USB also carries data or That's right. who knows if it's too many volts and that you know maybe it's sh got a short or something like that and could fry my phone so then all of a sudden we're afraid to plug into the USB port because hey it could be something bad That's right well wireless charging you Don't set it down about. it charges and you pick it up and you're done Yeah but you can set it down for like 3 minutes and it's given you enough of a charge to get through most of the afternoon which is incredible Awesome. I, I, I think just as a, I mean, you look around now and you've got all these charge stations for electric vehicles. It would be great to start seeing little pop-ups in public places with this kind of stuff where you can literally put your phone down for five minutes and have enough to have a phone call to get help or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's all wirelessly. I just pictured like a stretch of road. <laughs> <laughs> and embed the receiver in the car and it recharges the uh, autonomous car that as it drives awesome. over this thing. Whoa, we're getting into the tech now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Still, I like it. I'm excited about it. The crazy thing is, just uh, in conclusion, is that while what I just said is very sci-fi, like when we were growing up, that was like the future. It's totally doable. It's possible now. Yep. That's ridiculous. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has launched a compute module with the specs of a Raspberry Pi 4. The Raspberry Pi Foundation launched a new product Monday, the, com the Compute Module 4. It's hard to believe it's been so long, but the Raspberry Pi 4 was released in June 2019. The Compute Module 4 brings the Pi 4 to the industrial IoT space, featuring the same processor packed in a compute module just begging to be integrated into powerful IoT appliances.
If you're unfamiliar with compute modules, you can think of them as single board computers without all the ports and GPIO pins. They allow the computer components, the brains, of a Raspberry Pi to be integrated into robotics, smart devices, maker tech, clusters, or anything you can come up with that requires a tiny, low-powered Linux computer at its heart. Since the Compute Module 4 shares its spec with the Raspberry Pi 4, developers can do all their prototyping on the Pi 4 SBC, but then order a bunch of Compute Module 4s to integrate into their commercial product. Just like the Raspberry Pi 4, the Compute Module 4 features a 64-bit ARM-based processor with Video Core VI graphics. This is going to represent a huge upgrade for previous Compute Module customers, and with 4K video output, output at up to 60 frames per second, plus the ability to decode H.265 video, the Compute, module 4, the Compute Module 4 could be a game changer for multimedia-driven devices such as smart TVs or set-top boxes. The Compute Module 4 is available with your choice of 1, 2, 4, or 8 gigabytes RAM and 8, 16, or 32 gigabytes onboard eMMC flash storage. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are also optional. The price ranges from just $25 to $90 USD. Now imagine that, Jeff, the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 yeah. in one of your SBC projects or something like that, powering it like the brains. See, this is a pretty awesome. powerful... As soon as Becca said H.265 decoding, so that's like video that is very CPU intensive. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, like it says me, a lot. That's more power than my Plex server. Yes. Which, like, who knows where that's going to take things. I like the idea of cluster computing. And yeah, that's where okay. you take several computers, connect them together through networking, and basically install... Um, software, Beowulf or something like that, that clusters them to make them be able to perform tasks together in such a way that it basically makes a supercomputer right. out of several computers. So you think about these Raspberry Pi cl uh, cluster or the modules the, mm -hmm. and, and put like 10 of those together in a, a, a cluster. And you'd have like this compute module cluster That'd be nice. computer with that much power. When you can have eight gigs of RAM on each board, times that by <laughs> you 10. You can do a lot. You can do a lot. It's changing things, folks. The world is changing, mm -hmm. that's for sure. What would you do with all that power? And silence. He's waiting for you to answer. I, I'm thinking, I'm like, what would I do with that power? <laughs> How many people just went, Bitcoin mining. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's, you, you know what's sad? My first thought was, could I automate like some of the utilities that I have in the kitchen to make food for me? That was my first thought. With a with a compute module four? Yeah. Takes more than that, but I, I know, it but could be the brains of such an operation. Clearly, I am hungry, though. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts, comment below. We'd love to hear what, uh, what you would do with a Compute Module 4. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash Category 5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.